Roger, it's a tremendous pleasure to meet you and to talk about both your work with the Teen Cancer Trust as well as Teen Cancer America, and also your experience coming so close to death with meningitis. You and, and Pete Townsend have been such tremendous advocates for teens and young people with cancer, and your charities in the UK and here in the States are doing such amazing work. What was your motivation to create these? Um my motivation was that the, 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 that adolescent young adult age group, uh, which we recognize today as being totally different from young, young children and, and, and older adults. They are, that they've got their own language, they've got their own, the way they live is totally different emotionally and, and, and mentally completely different species. So, for this age group in particular, adolescents, young ad adults, not to have the ability to be around their peers when they're going through serious illness, I think is a really sad reflection on the fact that we have not noticed them. And um, it, it needed to change. I maintain that this, lot, this age group that we serve have been so underserved when it comes to the research because they they haven't been recognized. They're either pediatric or adult medicine. Well, cancer's not quite like that when it sits between the two ages. There's this kind of middle fuzzy area. I'm fighting for the Teenage Cancer Trust and Teen Cancer America to just have a small endowment from the cancer research people because we are providing a service for those researchers. We are pulling out that age group so that you can study them as a group for the first time. So we can have a, a Teen Cancer America uh, hospital in every big city across America. We're in 42 already, we've only been going eight years, but it needs to be done now because once, once this does get done, they will find, because this age group are growing so fast, their hormones are changing so rapidly, they get incredibly rare cancers, sometimes never seen in either of the other age groups. The researchers will find answers to cancer that they may not ever have found in because it hasn't been there for them to see. I'm, I'm with you and, and what you have been able to do in the US in such a short amount of time and of course in, in the UK for so much longer is just absolutely incredible. Um, did Roger, did your experience talking to young people with cancer help you through your experience with meningitis? Not really, no, no. I, the, the, my experience with young people with cancer is that they never cease to inspire me. They uh, never, never feel sorry for themselves. And I've met some, you know, real sad cases. Uh, and and the, the thing that hurts me most is when I meet the parents, which is another thing I could talk about for hours because no one ever thinks about the parents. You look in the eyes of a mother with a son with cancer who's 16 years old. If you want to see terror, that's terror. I've got to tell you. And the same with a father and a daughter. It's and they before we were there, they within the hospital systems, they didn't they didn't know anybody else whose teenager had cancer or you know, there was no communication where they could un unload what they were feeling and what their emotions that they were going through. Now, now we've got you know, more of a communal atmosphere in, in our units or, or hospital wards, whatever you want to call them. They can meet other parents. They unload, they, 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 they really support each other. And that is of immense, immense value, not only to the welfare of the parents, but the welfare of the, of the youngster going through it because he sees the, the weight lifted off his parents or her parents. I understand it, it took some time for you to be diagnosed with meningitis. Um, that's a really tough situation to be in, particularly, you know, as symptoms are progressing and you don't have answers. Can you share a little bit about that time with me? I was in terrible pain. I just remember that. And it, it was awful. But the worst thing of all was not knowing what, what exactly it was wrong with me. Um, and uh, obviously after they did lumbar punches and all the things they do. Um, which didn't bother me too much because I was so out of it. Um, but then on about the second night or the third night, um, 
I just lay there and I just, it was, it was just so awful. And I, and I remembered something that one of my physios that I had on the road uh, uh, years ago, way back in the 80s, she was an Austrian lady who'd come through the war, been through the, the whole gamut of, you know, the, the, the Germany being taken over and everything, and uh, really had a tough life. But she was ama an amazing spiritual person. And she used to, when she used to treat me with physio after the show, just to get the knots out, she used to say to me, what are you holding on for? What are you hanging on to? What are you hanging on for? She said, you know, just let go and it's easy. <laughs> you know, let go and it becomes easy. She said, what do you want to hang, this, hang on to this for? And suddenly, you know, I just thought about what, she, what she'd said to me. You know, Why are you hanging on so hard? Because there's something about when, you, when you, you're not quite sure what's going on with you. And yeah, there is a little bit of fear involved. It must be. But I lay there and I thought, what, what am I hanging on for? And I suddenly my brain went into what my life had been to what I expected it to be. And I just thought, well, who would ever have thought it? You know, I was I was someone born in the war in, in an air raid, uh, you know, got thrown out of school at 15, just wanted to be a singer, a musician and do you do music and the things I loved and acting and all those things and never thinking I ever could have actually made a living out of it but look at what happened look at what happened um you know I've been honored by the queen all those things I was thinking you know how, how much better could it have been Roger you know you know and then my fan I thought about my family and I thought well and I thought about all my friends and I thought I thought I don't leave anyone in the shit <laughs> And uh, so all of a sudden, I, 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 I just let go. I thought, you know, that's all right. Well, you, it's, you can't have it better than that. And I didn't see any lights at the end of the tunnel. Do I know whether I was near to death? I don't. I felt I was. I really did. I, did, I didn't think. I really seriously didn't mentally think I was coming out of this. And um, But all of a sudden, it was like being wrapped in cotton wool. I... I, I I just, it, I'll never forget the experience. It was really, really, I was so calm. And so, and I slowly started to get better from then. It was a long, long haul. It was another, another three and a half weeks in the hospital, but um, slowly started to get better. And it, and, but I still can remember that thing of when I finally said, you know, let go to myself. And I actually let go and thought, well, I don't mind. I don't mind. The next bit it's going to be an adventure like the first bit um and i've always looked on life as though it's a it's a queue you know it's a very long queue <laughs> but we're all in it some of us get to the front before we realize we're going to get to the front um but i reckon anything that's that's worth queuing for usually at the end of a queue there's something worth having i love that that's an amazing metaphor of the queue and and what a powerful uh, experience to have had uh, in life to be able to reflect yeah. on. Well, I, I mean, I've had quite a few brushes, <laughs> quite a few close calls. I was in the Who for 55 years. <laughs> that was a close call. I tell you, I survived Keith Moon. Um, I, I, I think it's like everything. I just go through life and I try and treat everybody the same. And I, and I mean, and I, and I do mean that even through from the royalty I've met, I try and imagine them as just, for want of a word, all on the toilet, and we're all the same. <laughs> and uh, I treat everybody like I would like to be treated myself. And and, and I, I I don't hold grudges. I must say I don't hate anybody. It's the one devastating word for humanity is hate. It's it's a it's it's it should be struck out of the dictionary and never used. It's it's horrible. Um, there there are, there are things I dislike, but hate is a whole new level of something evil. And I, so I don't hate anybody. I don't hold grudges. I let things go very easily. And I think that's again. I think I was like that before the meningitis, but the meningitis really brought it home. Why hang on? Just let go. Let it go. Get it out of your life. If you don't, if it's if it's dragging you down, let it go. Yeah, absolutely. 
I have, I have one, one more question for you. What is your personal philosophy about being mortal and our relationship, if any, to something larger than ourselves? I, I, look, on, I look on what we are as a ball of energy and the energy of the universe basically remains constant, a constant, but an energy just transfers. The universe only survives in its existence because it's transferring energy all the time. You know, black holes are swallowing stars that are being regurgitated and things are breaking up, smashing into things, reborn. But, you know, I think there's one life and it's eternal. You can't be free of this energy of the universe. You can, you can never be free of it. So I just always, I, my theory is, my, my philosophy is, you know, nothing leads, it just moves. This, this old taxi, this wears out, but the, the thing that drives it, that moves on somewhere else. And it doesn't matter where it is, it will always be part of the whole that we live in. Well, thank you, Roger, so much. It's been wonderful to chat with you and for all the amazing work that you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. All right, Shoshana, what the best to you. Bye.